Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Pastor John here. We're still in the series called Go Time. It's a Pentecost series. It's what the church is all about, what our lives to be all about. We're going to make disciples. We're, it's how we live is to lift up Jesus and that people are brought to him and grow in him. Today we're looking at it's time to serve humbly, which is to be the servant of all like Jesus, to live like Jesus. He, he's the servant king who came to lay down his life and be a servant. And that's what he lifts up to us in following him. So if you have your Bibles, look up Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 to 15, James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, powerful words there, and then our gospel reading for today, Mark chapter 9, verse 30 to 37, Jesus lifts up a little child and talks about welcoming children is how we serve humbly. So get ready for a powerful message, I know this one's for you. All right, it's still go time, go, 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 go. Go team! Come on. We're on a team. We're on the Jesus team. So we gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Newt Rotney, come on, come on, come on, come on. We got a game to play, a fight to fight. There's people who need a victory in their life. That's what the Go Time's all about. And in the Go Time series, we're in the fourth quarter. Okay, I'm gonna use a football analogy again. But here's the deal. I believe there's going to be an overtime and an overtime and an overtime and an overtime because, you see, God is not slow in keeping his promise because he doesn't want anyone to pair. So he keeps prolonging the time for people to come in. So there's go time and go time. Today it's this. It's time to serve humbly, low. In humility. We all need to see is that these two things are key when it comes to sharing Jesus with the world. It's got to be these two things. Humility and to serve. And to serve in humility. This is what people need to hear about Jesus. And from Jesus about Jesus from us. And it's what they also need to see. They need to see Jesus in us. Because this is really what Jesus looks like. Jesus is a servant king. He's a humble king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the creator. He's the everything of everything, and yet he came down to this earth to do two things. He came to serve, and he came to save. Matthew chapter 20, Jesus tells his disciples, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, to save. He came to serve and he came to save. And when you're my disciples, that's what you're called to do to serve, and to save. As we represent Jesus and who he is and what he came to do, this is what others need to see and hear from us. They need to hear how Jesus humbled himself to save us. That he left his throne in heaven. That he is the everything of everything. He humbled himself in becoming one of us. And he did it in order to save us to serve us, to help us in our great need. And they need to see this kind of life living in us as you and I follow him. That we live the same way Jesus did because that's how we represent him to the world. You guys still with me? Come on. That's our Jesus. He's a servant. He's the humble king who came to bless Paul says it this way in Philippians chapter 2. He said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, which means it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about, look what I did. I got it. I did it. I made it. It's mine. It's, a, it's all about me. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. You put them up their needs, their considerations. 
Each one of you should not only look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. How can I serve you? How can I help you? How can I bless you? Your attitude, how you think, what comes out of your house, heart that speaks out of your mouth, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, that's who he is, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or to hold on to. This is who I am. But he made himself nothing, nothing. Taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He went low, became obedient unto death, death on a cross. That's our Jesus. The amazing Son of God became nothing, who came to be a servant to serve our needs so that we might be saved. And that's who we get to represent in the world the God who loves us, the God who has blessed us, the God who is full of grace and mercy and love for people, the God who wants to bless and not curse. That's who we get to represent in the world by what we say and especially by what we do. But it's easy to lose sight of this truth in life that that's what it's all about. I raise my hand because I'll be the first one to admit I have. It's easy, right? That I'm really here for everyone else. He's already taken care of me. What do I need? Food and clothing. He says, I got that. He'll take care of that. You said I'm to die for? You bled and died for me. You give me grace. You give me mercy. You give me the next breath out of my, out of my, out of my lungs and into my lungs. And you, you determine exact places for me to, to be blessed and to be a blessing to other people. What do I need? I have it all in you. My identity comes from you. My life comes from you. Every good and perfect gift comes down from heaven from you. So I can be a blessing to others through you. But it's easy to lose sight. And that's what we see in Numbers chapter 12. I love this story. And I'm not being mean to Miriam. It's because it displays a truth so powerfully. You can't help but get it. And, and that's what the Lord wants. He said these stories really are not the people who lived it. It's about you and me. See, if we don't put our name in the Bible, we're going to miss everything that's there. I'm the Miriam. I'm the Aaron. This is about me and my life and how I'm living and what the Lord wants me to know. So I see it in somebody else's life so I don't have to do what they did. I can learn from them and I can see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living of what life is really all about. So he gave us this story. He let us know what happened so we don't have to go the same route. So Miriam and Aaron, they are Moses' older brother and older sister. How many of you have a younger brother or younger sister? Yeah. You know your place. Right? Don't think you're like me, you know. Get your own friends. So they're used to looking down on Moses in that sibling rivalry in that place. And so they're not afraid to grumble against Moses because of his Cushite wife. Oh, Moses, you are doing something bad. And with that attitude and that pride in their hearts, they say, who's he anyway? Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he also spoken through us? We're just as important as he is. But guess what? The Lord was listening. He didn't like it. In fact, 
Scripture lets us know that Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. You see, that was inserted there for us to know the context. Moses wasn't going around bragging about who he was. He knew who he was. He knew that he had killed an Egyptian soldier. He knew he didn't deserve anything. He grew up in Pharaoh's house. He, he put it aside. He wanted to obey God. He had an encounter with God. He was humble before God. He took off his shoes. He listened. He was obedient to what God said and was leading his people. But Aaron's brother and sister rose up against him. This caused the Lord to come down from heaven. And it wasn't a good thing. He came to set him straight. He told him, when there is a prophet, I reveal myself to them in vision and dreams. That's the way I normally talk to them. But with Moses, he is faithful in all my house. He's a good one. I speak face to face, clearly not in riddles, so he sees my form. There's a way that he's able to be in my presence in a closer way and have a more intimate relationship with me. You see, Moses had this special relationship with the Lord because of his humility. That's why I was put in this context. I want you to know about Moses. He humbled himself before me. He's been faithful. God opposes the proud, but gives grace, blessings, gifts, promotion, abundance to the humble who know he's the everything. It's why he was angry with Miriam and Aaron. And in their prideful attitude, they spoke against Moses, who is a type of Christ. It's another thing you need to see in the story. In the Old Testament, there's types of Christ. There's people who kind of represent Christ and what Jesus is going to do so that when he comes, they'll see this is how God has been working all along through someone who would be a type of Savior, who would humble himself, who would be a servant and, and serve so that other people would be blessed. You have it in Joseph. God gave him a vision. The sheaves bowing down, and the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down. He had a calling, but what happened? He was humbled. He was thrown away by his family. Another again, brothers, you're the but you're you're no good. You know, you're not who do you think you are talking down? It's the same story. And he goes and he becomes a servant in Potiphar's house, serving. He gets put in prison where he serves. And all the while, God's working and raises him up so that he might be a type of Jesus and saving of many people. And when the brothers come, he says, don't worry about it because this is what God did for the saving of many people, that he had to be humble, that he had to take that journey so that others would be blessed. Joseph is a type of Christ. Moses is a type of Christ is he came to lead people out of slavery, bondage in Egypt, and lead them through life, the desert, to the promised land where God would dwell in their midst. Just like Jesus came to rescue us from our bondage and slavery to sin, death, and hell, and lead us through life to a promised land in him, in this world, and forevermore with him in heaven. He's a type of Christ. But Miriam and Aaron were not afraid to grumble and speak against and pridefully look down on someone who's doing it right for them. And when, Moses, when Miriam becomes leprous, I want you to see what Moses did. He pleads to God for her to be healed. Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, Oh, no, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He prays for those 
crucifying him. He's a type of Christ. It's that humility that's able to see, I am here to serve and to bless. I am not here to judge. I am not here to put people down. I'm not here to grumble about anyone. I'm here to bless people so that they are lifted up to think more highly of what they need in their life than I do of my own because I already have it and I've been blessed and I get to live this way representing Jesus to the world as a type of Christ for other people all around me all the time. Nadia, see why I like this story? Man, it just, it comes alive with Jesus. And this life we get in Him. It's so important to understand how serving humbly is to the Lord. It's so important to Him. He looks at the heart. We have the same truth in James chapter 3. He starts this section with, who is wise and understanding? Who's the smart one? Come on, let's see how smart you are. See? The world will say you're smart if you're living for yourself. The Bible says you're smart and wise when you lay it all down. So who is wise and understanding? Let them show up by their good life, deeds done in humility. Serving, humbly. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition, when you make it about yourself and even complain because they got more than you, it's that envy, that bitter envy. Don't brag about it, he says. Don't boast about it because it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. What did Satan say? It's all about me. I want the glory. I don't want to serve you. I want people to serve me. You see, he shows the pattern of what heaven's like and what hell is like, what, what God is like and what the devil is like. He's setting it apart. There's two ways that this is done, God's way or his way. So he goes on to say, Oh, where you find envy and selfish ambition, there you'll find disorder and every evil practice. It just gets worse and worse. But wisdom from heaven, when you're really smart, is first of all pure. Because he's pure. Pure is holy. It's right. Every time. Then peace loving. I don't want to be in chunk with people. I want it to be peaceful. Because he's the prince of peace. He came to bring peace. Consider it. I consider your needs. Submissive, I will su submit myself to help. Full of mercy and good fruit. Mercy is, I have mercy. Good fruit is, I serve and I bless you. Impartial, not showing favor and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. This is the abundant life. I want no one to miss this. Do you know what the abundant life is? I just live to bless everyone else. You know why? I got so much blessing in me, I can't handle it. He's been pouring it out. Not worldly blessing, not earthly, not demonic, but godly, holy, pure, right. A heart that's been filled with His grace and His presence and His love that just keeps spilling out. And, and the way I get to bless people, talk to people, lift them up, serve them, and help them on their journey in life because I see they have a need and God has sent me to represent Him as a type of Christ in the world to bless them. It's what serving humbly is all about. It's why in Mark chapter 9, as He makes His way to Jerusalem for the last time, you got to understand the context Right before this, he had just come down from the mountain and the disciples couldn't drive out the demon and they were arguing with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law about it. And Jesus says, what's going on here? And he finds out and he, he casts out the demon. So this is right after that. He's going to Jerusalem and says Jesus is using this time to teach his disciples. He wanted to be with them because he's running out of time. He's saying, I got to get them ready to go. They're not ready to go. They just showed it with the demon and, and the arguing with the teachers of the law. So he wants to teach them more about how to live serving humbly. And he first tells them this. He says, this is what I'm going to do. 
I'm here to serve humbly. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. He is coming to lay down his life, to be obedient unto death, taking the form of a servant to serve all of us in our greatest needs. He who was first became last and the servant of all. And they didn't want to hear it. They didn't get it, and I think they didn't want to hear it. You ever find yourself kind of changing the subject when it's something you don't want to hear? You ever find those other thoughts come into your mind when it's about really doing the right thing? You see, the disciples knew this. He's our rabbi. We're following our rabbi to become like him. And if my rabbi is going to go and lay down his life and die on a cross, I didn't know that's what it was going to be. I don't think I want to know any more about it. Na, 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 na. They don't even ask a question. So when they get to Capernaum, where their hometown is, and settle in, Jesus asks them, what were you arguing about on the road. He's noticing their behavior. See, that's what people notice. They notice our behavior, how we act, the words that come out of our mouth. See, they had argued with the teachers of the law before this because they couldn't drive out demons, and now they're arguing among themselves about who's the greatest. All they're doing is arguing, arguing, arguing. You know anybody who likes to argue? Do you know what gets done with arguing? Nothing. I don't know anyone who's ever been argued into the Christian faith. If you, you find somebody, let me know, because there may be a first, but I've never, ever seen someone argued into the Christian faith because it's an invitation. Come to me. I did this for you, and it's for you. Do you want it? It's not about arguing, And it's not very humble when you're arguing. So Jesus tells them, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and servant of all. You've got to understand this concept of the kingdom. It's about serving, blessing, helping. All the good things that I came to bring that I entrust to you and you get to hand it out. I tell people, I get the front row seat of what God does. I'm just the pass-through. I'm like the conveyor belt. It's his stuff. It's not mine. I didn't save anybody. But he gets to pour it out. He gets to bless. Nickels, dimes, and quarters, they're not mine. They came from him. I get to pass them out. I brought nothing in. I take nothing out. I get to be the pass-through to bring glory to his name and to see people get blessed and lifted up and helped, set free. Whoever wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. I'm just going to say, I know how people think. Maybe some of you hey, is it okay if I don't want to be first? If I want to be like in the middle? If I, I just want to get a C minus? <laughs> Teachers, do you know anybody who lives that way? I just want to get a C minus. I don't really want to do the work. I don't want nothing. I just want to sit here and just do my time and get through and you got to promote me so I have this easy life. Jesus knows our heart. Why well, would no anyone not want to be first in his eyes for what he's done for us. It's not about achieving. It's about a desire to be what he is calling us to be. It's what Jesus did. He was first, did become the servant of all, the very last. 
And then he showed them what it looked like. He took a little child in his arms and said, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. You see, on the one hand, little children, they need help, right? Watching children is like one of the hardest jobs in the world. Where did they go? Where did they do? Don't touch that. Don't touch that. What is that I smell? Oh, no. Where are the diapers? They can't help themselves. We live in a world of people who can't help themselves. They need help. That's why it lifts up a little child. A little child needs help. And they need someone to serve and to help them. Else their life is misery. And they don't make it. Also, little children were looked down upon. Because the men are important and the women are second class. And children, we hardly notice them. They're only to be seen but not heard. They're no big deal. You know what's going on in that room? The father saying, oh, I love these children. Jesus is saying, oh, let them come to me. And the workers who are back there, they're getting it all. Because that's how he works. It's what the kingdom is about. It may be little children, but it may be older people who just don't know. It's the same thing. When we welcome them, when we love them, when we bless them, when we encourage them, when we help them to see what they don't see and to understand what they can't understand on their own, and the Spirit of God works because we're there to serve them. Here's what a lot of people will do, and they need to hear it in a way they can hear it because sometimes we try to go through the front door we pound on it. If only you were good enough, you would listen to what I'm saying. And little do we know that behind that door, someone has been hurt by a lot of salesmen who's come, and that's why they say no solicitation on this property. They've been burned. They've been hurt. They've been manipulated. And they just don't trust people. That's why when you come a servant and you say, how, how do they need to receive it? You ask God. And this is what God says. Bake an apple pie and go around to the back and just kind of go like that. <laughs> and they'll come out. Because it's safe. You're actually coming with a gift. You're not force feeding them and treating them like dirt. You're lifting them up higher than you. And saying, tell them you're to die for. And you need to know the one who's done it for you, who wants you. Jesus is saying, you're, you're to love, you're to welcome, you're to serve those who are helpless as he did. And as we do, we're really doing it as unto him because we're obeying what he says. So the take home is when I live to serve humbly, others will see a faith that is real. You think people need to see a faith that's real? I think they're crying out for it. They're just doing it in a way we don't get it. But they're really saying for Christians, I want to see something that's real. I want to see that what you actually believe is how you're living that actually makes a difference in your life. Because when we look like everyone else, they're going to say, I don't need that. I already got it. You're just like me. But when they see us laying it down, generous, kind, humble, grateful, helpful, as Jesus did for us, they become open and they go, what do you have? I want some of that. It looks good to my eyes. That looks real. That genuine loving care. 
They'll see a faith that's real because they'll see what Jesus looks like in us. Secondly, when I live to serve humbly, others will experience a love that is real. You, guess what? People can tell when it's real. They can say all the words, but they can tell. They can tell by how much time you give them. This is love. Jesus didn't say, I'm only coming for three days and I'm out of here. He came for 30 years and then three more. And he stayed after for, get them ready. They see a love that's real, that's, that genuinely cares, that helps in a way that helps. I'll tell a story in Brazil, a quick story. I've seen it, I've seen it here, but I saw it there. There were men who wanted impartation. They want they to live for God, but they're, I could tell they're stuck. And what I spend most of my time doing with these men is I'd give them a hug and I'd hold on and I'd release the Father's love over them because that's something they've never experienced in their life. They didn't even know that's what they needed. But the Lord showed me that's what they needed. And by the time I left and I took some pictures of these guys, they were beaming it's a confidence and a courage to live for God is that he loves me. In fact, he, he brought someone into my life to express that love and to speak those words that were genuine and they could tell was real. People know when it's real. His love is real. But he's chosen to give it away through us. We are his body in the world. We're the arms that hold on to. We're the voice that speaks the words. We're the feet that walk with them on that journey. No matter how long it takes, we're sticking with you. You're worth it. Last one is this. When I live to serve humbly, others will be drawn to a Savior who is real. See, that's what people don't really know. Is he really real? They don't see him. He's invisible. So is he real? But then they encounter somebody who has him, who's living that humble servant life, who said, I just want to bless you and love you in Jesus' name. You need to know what he's done for me. I want, I want to tell the stories because that's, the testimonies are the sweet-smelling aroma of apple pie with ice cream. chocolate milk if you like it. It's the sweet smelling aroma of what Christ does. If he does it for that person, maybe he would do it for me. And the testimony says, I know the one who's real. I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. He has healed my life. He has made me whole. Let me tell you where I was and where I am now. And it's because I got a touch from the one. I had an encounter with the living Lord, and I embraced it, and I started walking in it, and he changed my life. And I am so full of life and love, and I am so blessed. That's why I'm here, because you need to know. So, Lord Jesus... Open our eyes that we might see. Open our ears that we might hear from you. Lead the way. Because we do. We want to follow you. Amen? Pray that today's message spoke to you. And you could agree, people need to not only hear about Jesus, but they need to see Jesus in us. And the words of affirmation and the kindness and the good deeds and the, the way we walk in humility. If we can be a blessing to you on that journey, give us a call. Our number is 501-525-0322. And if you want to join us Sunday morning live or on Facebook, our Facebook page is First Lutheran Church Hot Springs AR. And we come on at 8.30 and 11 o'clock Central Time. So God bless you. And uh, let's go. It's go time. See you next time.